Uh, okay, so today we have uh, Edward Carpenter here, and he is a professor at the San Francisco State University at the Department of Biology. Um, and he got his bachelor degree in biology from the State University of New York College at Fredonia and a postgraduate education at North Carolina State University. He then followed with a postdoctoral fellowship at Woods Hole. Graphic Institute, um, and he's a call of the Antarctic Dry Valley. And today he's here to here to talk to us about the nitrogen fixation in the Antarctic Dry Valley. Welcome. I think you muted yourself. <laughs> okay. All right. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, well, I don't exactly know what the format should be, so I thought I would just give a like a start off with a little bit of a general introduction to uh, the Antarctic uh, ecosystem and uh, the McMurdo Dry Valleys and say just a little bit about uh, uh, the stations around there and a little bit, bit about the whole ecosystem and then sort of get into some of the research that we did there. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay, so um, we work out of McMurdo Station. It's a, about 1,400 uh, people there in the summertime, in the austral summer. Uh, this is Observation Hill over here. And uh, on top of it is a cross that was erected uh, for uh, Scott, who was uh, died on the way back from. Uh, the South Pole uh, after Amundsen got there first. <laughs> and oops, I'm having a little trouble advancing. Uh, and right next to the McMurdo station is Scott Base, and that's the New Zealand base. Um, and they paint their buildings uh, color of kiwi fruit. Okay. So uh, uh, right next to McMurdo station, maybe about um, 20, 30 kilometers away. And the reason why they're dry is that you have the Transantarctic Mountains here that separates the West Antarctic Ice Sheet and the East Antarctic Ice Sheet. And it sort of acts as a barrier to uh, moisture coming in. So you can't really see the dry valleys. They're located right about, right about here. Uh, and uh, they are extremely harsh in terms of the environment. Uh, they have, uh, they're extremely cold, uh, they're extremely windy. These are catabatic winds that come down off the plateau and they can reach uh, 322 kilometers an hour in the dry valley. So you have an extremely dry, cold climate uh, with uh, very few, uh, very little uh, organic input. So the so soils are very acidic. Uh, the microorganisms are the eubacteria, cyanobacteria, archaea, diatoms, mosses, no higher plants. Uh, the only animals are three species of soil nematodes. Uh, two of them eat bacteria, one of them eat the other nematodes. You got rotifers, tardigrades, and uh, the biggest ones are the springtails. And every once in a while, um, a seal or a penguin will get lost and wander in there. But the, other than that, this is the whole ecosystem of the dry valleys. <clears throat> the nematodes, they can lose about 99% of their free water. They can be basically freeze, freeze dried for the whole winter. And they, they can survive almost forever in that state. And, then, and they're also just blown around by the wind uh, in the dry valleys. And as soon as they, uh, encounter liquid water, they spring back to life. Um, and here's the dry valley nematode. Uh, tardigrades, one of the toughest animals on earth. We brought some, back some cyanobacteria and mosses from the dry valleys and there were tardigrades living in it, uh, you know, when we brought it back to our laboratory. Uh, so they're an extremely hardy uh, or, uh, organism. So 
There are some special adaptations for a really stressful environment. Uh, these are cryptoendolithic microorganisms. So this is a like a cross section through a sandstone rock. And you can see inside of the rock are um, uh, green algae, lichens, or cyanobacteria. And so they just live inside of the these sandstone rocks. They get a little bit of sunshine during the summertime. They grow extremely slowly. The uh, thing that limits their, their growth um, is the availability of water. So there's, there is there are there is some snow that falls there in the dry valleys, but very often it just sublimates right away, even before it, it melts and gets into the rock. So uh, typically sandstone, uh, they get a lot of protection from really harsh conditions. <clears throat> their metabolism is limited by liquid water. Uh, they're really slow growing. And the story about these rocks is really interesting. And this isn't in the dry valleys. This is in the, the Negev desert in Israel. Um, Imri Friedman, uh, he studied these rocks in the, the Negev in Israel. And he said, I would imagine that the same uh, type of conditions could uh, exist in the dry valleys. Uh, but he wrote proposals to the National Science Foundation. He could not get any funding because there was no preliminary data. And so he had a friend that was going down there and he said, would you collect these rocks for me in the dry valleys? And uh, while in the dry valleys, the friend died, he sort of gave up hope. And months later, the, the, the wife of that friend called and she said, I got the belongings back from my husband who died down there and there's a bag of rocks with your name on it. So he, he got the rocks, cracked it open and there were the organisms. And then he was able to uh, say, I got the preliminary data and he got funded. Uh, some other things I mentioned, the seals <coughs> and the penguins, <clears throat> they sort of wander into the dry valleys and there are um, unique microbial communities that, uh, exist under these uh, dead mummified organisms. Uh, the, the soil underneath them is moisture and uh, the rare microbes in the, um, in the soils uh, become more abundant. And these have been studied by uh, Craig Carey uh, from uh, University of Waikato in New Zealand. He's got several papers on it. So during the winter, Virtually all these organisms are essentially freeze dried and the cyanobacteria will start to photosynthesize within about 20 minutes of being hydrated after a long cold winter. So we studied these ephemeral streams. So for about six to seven weeks in the austral summertime, uh, these glaciers on top of the mountain, the sunlight hits them. Uh, and uh, these little streams uh, set, set, start to set up and around the streams are what we call the hyperreic zone. This is the wetted moist zone. Uh, so the microbes in that hyperreic zone uh, are uh, spring to life and also uh, microbes that are sort of on, on the surface um, <clears throat> uh, cyanobacteria, et cetera. So this is a glacier here. This is one of the streams that flows out of the, the glacier. And these, the black mats, we've got two types of mats, orange mats and black mats. The black mats are dominated by Nostoc commune. And you can see all the heterocysts by these nitrogen fixing uh, cyanobacteria. And uh, this is a black mat. Um, right here, and the orange <coughs> mats are dominated by oscillatoria and formidium. Uh, so two different major types of mats. This is an orange mat right here, and this is one of those glacial meltwater streams. Um, this is a stream gauge, which we use to measure the flow rates, so uh, we can have it set up. And so this is a glacier back here, and stream comes in from that glacier, and then we can, um, we can measure the, the flow rates of the streams. 
and the water flow is highly re related to the microbial activity. So this is the hyperreic zone. You've got all these bacteria and cyanobacteria uh, existing in it. Uh, and then along the sides here, you would have the, uh, the wetted area up here where there's a fair amount of sunlight. You would have the, the black mats or the orange mats. And uh, we would sample along a transect. And here we are. We can measure, um, dig a little hole, um, put in a syringe with a, some silicone tubing and pull out some water and measure the nutrient content of the water, the bacterial content. <clears throat> um, and so this, this transect here goes, let's say about 20 meters from the um, edge of the, the water stream across and we can, we can then take a look at the microbial types and activity in relationship to the moisture content and the nutrient content. So this is one of our papers, microbial community composition of transiently wetted Antarctic dry valley soils uh, that was in frontiers of microbiology. So we could run the, those transects from the wet center out to about 20 meters. Uh, generally the pH increased and the chlorophyll A decreased as we went from the stream edge, you know, to the uh, really dry area. Uh, so it would go from about pH of about seven to nine uh, going on that transect. And uh, the chlorophyll A concentrations would go from higher concentrations to lower. Uh, and, and we also used uh, RNA pyrosequencing. We saw a higher abundance of uh, cyanobacteria and diet, diatoms in the wet soils near the stream and higher abundances of other uh, microbial groups um, in the arid soils. Uh, and fungi dominated in those arid soils too. So that wetting has a really profound effect on the bacteria, bacterial in the eukaryotic communities. Um, okay, so higher quality quantities of chloroplast signatures in the wet soils. Signatures were almost exclusively related to the streptophyta. Uh, and uh, that's a green algal group uh, that's known to have the ability to live in really stressful environmental conditions where there's a lot of desiccation, high irradiance and high UV levels. Um, so there's a lot of localization of these different microbial groups uh, related to the amount of water uh, that they're exposed to. So uh, what's interesting is that the primary production rates, the photosynthetic rates of these mats uh, reach a, a upper limit of about uh, four. Uh, I can't see my units because my picture is on top of it. <laughs> uh, they, but they saturate at about 100 micromole photons per square meter per second, uh, which is relatively low light because the amount of light that we get there is from about 50 to about 1,000 micromole photons per square meter per second during the summertime. Um, so these mats are very important, these orange and black mats, as a source of energy for the lake organisms because um, car fixed carbon will run from the these mats into the lakes. Um, and <clears throat> also during the, the um, wintertime, those catabatic winds wind up blowing these dried out mats all around the dry valleys. This is another one of our papers. Um, so we could identify the nitrogen fixers with NIF-H uh, gene sequencing. We could measure the acetylene uh, Using the acetylene reduction technique, we could measure N2 fixation rates. Uh, the N2 fixation rates range from about 0.5 to 6 nanomoles per uh, cubic centimeter uh, per hour of, of these mats. And what was interesting about that is that in this really harsh environment, the carbon fixation rates and the N2 fixation rates are comparable to those in terrestrial, uh, let's say, temperate and uh, also subtropical uh, and marine ecosystems like coral reefs and intertidal lagoons. Basically, 
what's amazing in this really harsh environment is just add water and uh, everything springs to life. Um, pretty neat. So uh, let's see, we looked at the cyanobacterial antifixation rates. Uh, our research showed that about half of the antifixation rates uh, were linked with sulfate reduction at, at many of the sites. We could use uh, 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 use the addition of uh, to uh, inhibit uh, sulfate reduction. Then we could tell how much and uh, uh, to fixation rate was done by autotrophic organisms as opposed to uh, sulfate uh, reducers, uh, uh, oxidizers. Um, so about half is uh, is uh, from the cyanobacteria, and half are from uh, chemolithotrophs. Another uh, interesting thing is um, these are hypolithic communities. You can find these little uh, communities underneath translucent rocks. So the rocks uh, will let enough light go through uh, for the cyanobacteria. This is a, uh, a cyanobacteria um, hypolithic uh, little ecosystem. So the rock protects the cyanobacteria from desiccation, moisture. What happens is that you've got permafrost, but during the sun, summertime down there, you have uh, an upper layer that might be um, a quarter of a meter thick, okay, that, that is melted. And that, and the moisture that's in the, the uh, melted layer uh, is constantly wicked up by the wind blowing over the, uh, over the uh, dry valley uh, soils. And um, the, the rock lets enough light through the translucent rock and it protects the cyanobacteria from uh, being dried out. And so you've got nitrogen fixing and carbon fixation occurring in these little pockets on the bottom of the rocks. And also another thing that happens is that you've got these mosses with cyanobacteria mixed in with them that are, uh, that are also little ecosystems as well related to these translucent rocks. Um, yeah, so active fixation, um, uh, all of these cyanobacterial sequences were related to the uh, order Nostocales, nitrogen fixers, and those moss communities uh, contribute carbon fixation to the uh, oligotrophic environment. And so this came out in environmental and microbiology reviews, 2011. So um, on the lakes in the dry valleys, uh, the ice can be 20 meters thick. Uh, it's, you were able to drill, drill through it and, and uh, get to the bottom to look at uh, one of the microbial communities of, in the liquid water under the ice. Um, another interesting thing about that is that uh, you've got these blackened particles. <laughs> it could be uh, a piece of microbial mat, it could be a piece of soil, and they land on the top of the ice and, but then during the summertime with solar, uh, they, they pick up sunlight and because they're black, they warm and then they melt the ice underneath them and they slowly make it down through the ice. And uh, they, so the, the lake ice is also ablated by the adiabatic winds from the top and new ice forms on the bottom. So that ice isn't just static. And here we have all these little darkened particles making it down uh, through the ice, you know, vertically, because they, they pick up sunlight, they're little solar cells. Uh, also in the summertime down there, a moat forms around the edges of the, the lakes. Uh, and you've got cyanobacteria here in these moats, um, fixing carbon, fixing nitrogen. And then of course, in the wintertime, it all freezes, freezes way back up again. <clears throat> so 
in the liquid water in those lakes, um, there's very little light that makes it down there, but there's enough for uh, phytoplankton, certain species of low light adapted phytoplankton to live. Uh, because there's no wind mixing under the ice, you've got a really stratified water column. Uh, those phytoplankton are very shade adapted. They're very nutrient limited. Uh, addition of phosphorus or nitrogen and phosphorus will stimulate photosynthesis. And um, that the input of the stream water from those ephemeral streams uh, brings in some nutrients and also organic matter for those lakes as well. So lake water, when we look at the uh, phytoplankton down there, got cryptomonads, chrysophytes, diatoms, chlorophytes, uh, but of course, no fish. <laughs> um, but microzooplankton and, and protozoa graze on the phytoplankton. Um, no large predators down there at all. A lot of mixotrophic uh, protozoa, ones that uh, have um, captured um, chloroplasts from other organisms. Got heliozoa or sun animalcules. Um, this is strombidium, uh, protozoan. So they're grazing on the uh, phytoplankton down there. Uh, another little ecosystem down there are cryokonite holes. Uh, so what happens on the glaciers is soot, soil, and other microorganisms are blown onto the glaciers. And uh, the, they will decrease where they, where they land, just as with the ice and the, the dark particles on the ice. They decrease the albedo or the reflectivity of the glacier and those darkened particles absorb heat. That ice melts and it forms a little tiny pond uh, which will be inhabited by microalgae, bacteria, possibly microzooplankton. And each one is sort of a little ecosystem on its own. So these are cryokonite holes here. Okay, and uh, they, the, um, Sediments, the darkened sediments can fall to the bottom. You could have liquid water formed by the absorption of sunlight in the summertime, and then they can actually become refrozen again. And so here's an air layer here. That's a glacier ice uh, own little ecosystem here. And uh, here they, here's a cryokonite hole. And um, the, the, this is a represents a phytoplankton um, and you've got uh, nutrient transformations occurring. You've got the, these little round sediment particles. Uh, you've got nitrogen fixing microbes uh, and also uh, decomposing microbes, these, these little white things here. So some of the uh, ponds in the dry valleys are extremely saline. This is a Don Juan pond that's so salty it never freezes, even in the, the middle of the winter time. It's uh, yeah. about 18 times the salinity of seawater. Mostly calcium and chloride uh, are the salts. Um, the DNA sequences indicate that there are microbes in the pond under these really, really high salty conditions, but um, it's unknown whether they were blown in or actually living there. So more work has to be done on that. But there are microbes uh, as in the pond water uh, as shown by the DNA sequences. Uh, we can use these little quadrats. Uh, these are little plastic pipettes that we use zip ties to put them together. Uh, we use them to quantify uh, the area covered by mats. And this is an algal mat right here, kind of irregular in shape. <clears throat> we wanted to know how fast um, you could recolonize an area. So uh, we uh, put the, got this paper out, Rapid Microbial Dynamics in Response to an Induced Wetting Event. Um, and what we wa did was we, when we were in New Zealand, um, we picked up um, gutters. I'm not sure what you call them in Swedish, but uh, it, these would be on the edges of your roof, uh, you know, to collect the water. Um, and uh, we 
put them together and we uh, use these roofing gutters and also some big tubing uh, to try to divert a stream water to a new valley. So, so we built a dam um, and we were able to use this tubing here and these gutters over here uh, to try to uh, divert the water uh, to, and you can see the, this is the wetted area here, this is water, uh, to an area that didn't have a stream before. And, and uh, we were able to follow it during the astral summer uh, for about five, seven weeks. Um, and we, we looked at the bacterial eukaryotic and archaeal communities uh, on time zero uh, using uh, TRFLP based analyses and the cyanobacterial component using ERISA DNA fingerprinting. And we could see changes as soon as that wa liquid water uh, came to that soil, that arid soil in that new little valley, if you want to call it that, uh, changes were uh, we could begin to see them within three days. Uh, one really big change was an increase in the cyanobacteria, increase in members of the chloroflexi. This is a swimming protozoan ciliate. <clears throat> also freshwater uh, protists. Uh, these are protozoa, Chrysococcus, Rophysomonas, and also the diatom here, Navicula. Uh, big increases in bacterioides and alpha, beta, and delta proteobacteria. And also, of course, the um, cyanobacteria, I mean, the nematodes, because they're, they're basically blowing around, you know, and many times in a freeze-dried state, they land in a wet area and their relations go up too. So the predictions are that these dry valley soils are gonna become warmer and wetter. <coughs> and so this should, really um, increase the diversity of the microbial uh, communities as well. So this is the percentage distribution of the bacterial phylogenetic groups. And these are the cyanobacteria right here. And you can see how this is day zero over here, six hours and all the way up to seven weeks, okay? Um, and uh, uh, we have, these are green algae. So we saw a pretty good size uh, increase in them and uh, others. Uh, here we've got the eukaryotic uh, phylogenetic groups, uh, uh, Viridi plantae, these are the greens, stramenopiles, the, these are the, these would be brown algae and also diatoms. I, don't think that there were any brown algae there, but uh, definitely diatoms are the stramenopiles. Uh, the metazoan uh, protozoans, uh, or for example, uh, could be the, the tardigrades. The haptophytes, these, would, these are a group that uh, would be um, coccolithophores, but I doubt if they, uh, there were any calcifying co coccolithophores there. There are non-calcifying haptophytes as well. And uh, the alveolata are the um, ciliates, dinoflagellates, and uh, other protozoa as well. So we got uh, big increases, big changes uh, within that seven week period uh, from that stream diversion uh, experiment. Uh, the metazoa or the nematodes, big increases in protozoans. Overall, a doubling of the species rich richness in seven weeks. And so again, just as with um, adding water you know, to the cyanobacteria, to the freeze-dried cyanobacteria and getting rates that are comparable to what you get in a, a uh, tropical area, uh, it's, it's amazing. Just this shows you the importance of the liquid water in this extremely dry environment. And by the way, um, the, I mean, I read the other day that they found a fair amount of water on the moon uh, and of course there is some water on Mars and this area is that the dry valleys are probably the closest analog to um, conditions on Mars. And so uh, it's been it's thought that, uh, that perhaps uh, liquid water on Mars uh, could um, uh, also uh, lead to microbial life. Now here, here's a black mat 
and that sampling, and here's the moat around the lake. And so this is uh, sampling the mats around the moat. And all you have to do is have a little bit of liquid water and these mats uh, spring back to life. <clears throat> um, I wanted to also mention, this is not in the dry valleys, but there's about 400 subsurface lakes in Antarctica. Here's a coring tube. It's 2.2 miles deep. And this is Lake Vostok over here near the Russian station. And uh, there are about 400 uh, different lakes uh, under the ice, the really, really, really thick ice in Antarctica. And so this is, um, this is the flow rate, flow direction of the glacier. Uh, this is the salty, briny water. Uh, this is the main lake basin. The briny water would, of course, would be below it. You've got a little bit of heat coming from geothermal activity, and that, that's what causes the liquid water under the lake. <clears throat> and so these are um, different organisms. About 96% of them were eubacteria, less than 1% archaea, about 4% uh, are eukaryota. The majority are, are fungi. You've got amoebas. Um, you've got... Uh, dinoflagellates, uh, yellow-green algae, ciliates, and um, this, these are um, different uh, boreholes here, V5 and V6. This one had about 138 unique sequences, and um, you have uh, a lot of different uh, groups here. And the energy source for most of them is just the oxidation of reduced uh, yeah, um, hydrogen sulfide, et cetera. Yeah, so uh, bacteria get their energy by oxidizing the reduced iron and sulfur compounds. Proteobacteria <clears throat> make up the um, majority of the gene sequences. Ammonium is the principal dissolved inorganic nitrogen species. And there are nitrogen, nitrifying or organisms present, of course, converting the ammonia to a nitrite and, and nitrate. And this was reported, not by us, but in the journal Nature. I just thought I'd throw it out there. Um, also, uh, our group went to the South Pole and we went to the clean sector, sector of the South Pole. The, at the South Pole, the air generally blows in one direction. So um, any... Um, human activity in the South Pole would go in that direction. And we went to the clean sec sector, uh, which is usually not affected by uh, the um, blowing of the winds uh, or, or human activity. And I was able to find uh, pretty good sized populations of bacteria in the snow melt from 200 to 5,000 cells per milliliter of snow melt. And the DNA and protein uh, synthesis measurements showed that the bacteria were actively growing. And a good number of them were fairly closely related to Deinococcus. Um, this is a bacterium that uh, is able to uh, live in really high radiation um, environments. And uh, I, I sent an email to the per a person that um, studies Deinococcus, and he was really surprised to, to find it down there in the South Pole snow. But then he said, well, of course, you know, really cold, ultra cold weather is going to break DNA. And uh, so, you know, the, the same, um, same adaptations that they have, that Deinococcus has for living in a high radiation environment uh, it would be, um, beneficial to it in, in an ultra cold environment. So we used tritiated thymidine and leucine to measure the bacterial activity. And this is time and hours down here. And you could see that we were, had to be extremely careful because we had to work in a cold room. Uh, we we um, worked at, um, we measured the temperature of the snow and fern that we sampled from and on that day, <clears throat> it was minus 17 degrees Celsius. So we worked at uh, minus uh, 17 degrees Celsius. 
we had we used minus 80 degrees as a control and we also had uh, uh, TCA killed uh, cells as a control and we can see uh, very very uh, slow but uh, consistent um, increases in the leucine uptake using tritiated leucine and also tritiated thymidine here these black circles so we we uh, wrote a paper, wrote that paper up and sent it off to science and they rejected it and we sent it off to nature and they rejected it. And so we did get it into, I think it was applied in environmental microbiology. <clears throat> and then um, after that, uh, there were uh, critiques coming in uh, that uh, this, this is impossible. You can't have bacteria growing at uh, minus 17 degrees Celsius, uh, written critiques that were published in, in the journal. but. What was really neat was several people went back out and duplicated our research, you know, confirming, you know, that these bacteria were indeed growing at minus uh, 17 degrees Celsius. So that was kind of neat. So microbial life exists in the dry valleys uh, in, and also in the snows, of even as far as the uh, South Pole, as far south as the South Poles. The metabolic rates that can equal that in the temperate and tropical regions, if, as long as liquid water is present. And uh, we also have shown that uh, these microbial communities can really quickly adapt to environmental changes. And uh, I just wanted to mention, if you want to study an Antarctic microbes, uh, you can go to the Swedish station here, uh, which is, uh, <laughs> of course, it's got the colors of the Swedish flag. Um, and uh, I would like to thank co-workers, Craig Carey, Jill Soam, Doug, Tom Niederberger, Alex Parker, Troy Gunderson. Uh, this, is, uh, this work was supported by the National Science Foundation. Uh, this is our, our center at San Francisco State University, uh, Estuarine and Ocean Science Center. Um, and uh, this is the logo of, of SFSU biology department. So I'd be happy as well as I can to uh, try to answer any questions you might have. <clears throat>